This podcast is made possible by the Lighthouse Foundation for the Blind San Francisco, part of the Holman Journey 2019. Professor Cook currently holds a position at Swinburne University in Melbourne doing astronomical research. He is originally from the US and has worked at Caltech and the University of California. He leads over 30 major projects that have a wide range of astronomical diversity and interdisciplinary fertilization. Among others, Professor Cook is responsible for the deeper, wider, faster network, which aims to provide real-time analysis of astronomical data, spanning from fast gamma ray bursts using a large ground and orbital telescope array, which can be directed to focal points in the sky when an event is identified. Okay, hello everybody on the internet. Uh, this is podcast nine of the Astro Hunters uh series uh, which is sponsored by the Lighthouse for the Blind Um, and this is for our project and the Holman journey of trying to make astronomy and astrophysics accessible uh, to people like myself, BVI, blind people, visually impaired and perhaps get some intuition from thinking out of the box into a hardcore science field which is astrophysics. So today we got Professor Jeffrey Cook who is hailing from Swinburne University in Melbourne. He's an astrophysicist and has a large body of work which have you know uh, there's a lot of different fields Jeff that you've actually uh, covered and they sort of culminate into an extremely interesting program which uh, we will define later but thank you for accepting to this interview to go through this interview thank you i really appreciate it it's great to be here and so just to start the first question is pretty much what first caught your attention to look into the sky and just kind of you know gave you that drive to come up all the way now uh, as being a professor in astrophysics oh wow okay so it's a it wasn't a thing. I, I, I think I've had it since I was born. It was one of those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been a long road too to get here. So I, if I think back, I can remember even in kindergarten, you know, seeing planets on the posters on the wall and being fascinated by that. And as most kids, you know, you think of space. But as I was getting older, I was not, I didn't play a lot of sports. I did do a lot of outside stuff, but I kind of just, you know, I, I read and I looked at you know numbers, and I, I saw that you know the distances of the planets and how they rotate. And I thought, oh, there's a pattern here, and I was trying to figure out things. And, and I even remember in my fifth year, I I presented my theory on the formation of the solar system to my teacher. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and and my teacher at the time knew very little about science and astronomy, so they were probably like, oh, that's great. Anyway, uh, go back and sit down. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> Yeah, but I kind of had, yeah, I kind of had that bent from the start. Yeah, that's a definitely a skill. You know, <laughs> I think the French people call it precocious skill, and that's actually yeah. you know advanced um, understanding of things, which is actually quite a quite a quality to have. So, I guess mm-hmm. uh, you've moved on to college, and you know, started really kind of associating your passion with your work. Yes. And uh, what are some of the first kind of you know studies that you you know that you've covered? Well, I mean, I, I am not, I'm not a person that can, you can classify as you'll, you know, as I'll pan out in this uh, interview. I, I started doing a lot of things. I mean, I, I first looked into planetary nebula, which is, you know, the end states of a star like our sun. And that was a, a small research project. And then I started just kind of looking at different things out there. And I started at my PhD work on actually on planet transits. So when a planet goes in front of stars. And then, but felt a gravitation, oh, that's a bad word to use. <laughs> but I got pulled toward uh, extra galactic or very distant universe, early universe and high redshift. So then I, most of my work from there on was in the high redshift universe, looking mm. at set galaxies and, and supernovae. So to those who are listening, high redshift as opposed to low redshift is, a, is kind of a measure of distance in some okay. ways of a, uh, objects which are very very far out so a redshift which is higher means that it's actually earlier in history yeah mm-hmm. is that correct no, no that is correct so because so a uh, high redshift is yeah you can equate to very distant yeah. and very distant means very long ago because uh, light takes time to get here it, it takes time to travel to here to across the universe and so the things that i study 
are maybe 10, eight or 10 to 12 billion years ago is when that light left and finally got here. And over that journey, the universe has expanded over all that time. And so the wavelength of those light, of that light gets stretched yep. and it becomes redder. And so you call it, it's a shifted to the red, so it's a red shift. So the more red shift, the more it's stretched to the farther that object is. Yeah. And I guess the opposite is when the object is really accelerating towards us, yes. uh, which we don't really want. We don't want the <laughs> galaxy to just kind of, you know, hurl towards us. Then the shift will turn blue. Uh, yeah, so. there's the motion aspect of it coming towards you away, and then there's just the general stretching of the universe. That's right. Yeah, and so that kind of allowed you to to use, I guess, college and your PhD really gave you all of the tools that you you needed. Uh, you know, from fundamental, I guess, first principle all the way, you know, out to having kind of this this ability to pull out different techniques, almost you know, as a reflex to observe the, the, the multiple objects out there, and there's so many right now. But getting into a bit more of one of your papers, which I, I found quite fascinating, and that kind of ties in with some of those tools that could be useful for sonification. It's the, um, I hope I don't butcher this, the super illuminated supernovas? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's super a, lot luminous. Super, a lot of superlatives there, that's right. It's a super luminous supernova, that's right. And so supernovae, which are the deaths of massive stars, um, just really quick, a, a, a very massive star is a big ball of gas like our sun and then it, and it's mostly made of hydrogen and there's helium, but the helium sinks to the center because it's heavier and in space, if you're floating, the heavier goes to the middle and over its lifetime, uh, it fuses hydrogen to helium and more helium gets packed in the core and then pretty soon that gets hotter and more dense and if the star is massive enough, then that helium burns it fuses and forms heavier elements like carbon and oxygen. And, and this process continues through some different elements, but all along the star is living and, and shining and it's using up its fuel. And then when it gets to the point where that fuel is exhausted, the core of that star collapses and rebounds and it into a, just an incredible explosion, which is called a supernova, which also ejects a lot of this material out. And so you get all of these elements uh, ejected out into space and that's what where elements come from other than hydrogen and helium where most of the elements come from and what make up planets and earth and us and puppy dogs and things like that it comes from the elements <laughs> so so it's a continuous cycle of, of kind of life and death between each different or even fusion between each different types and in, in transition from fundamental I guess molecules in the universe and their quantities which then reaches you know higher levels of complexity but what is a safe distance from a exploding supernova let's say most i believe that the stars which reached over twice the mass of the earth are capable of exploding into supernovas um it takes well this is a hard measure but it, i think most people think that it's about eight times or more before oh, eight times or more. okay yeah. Yeah. Uh, and but you know it's it's a few times more and then they they explode and it is a tremendous explosion because you think of an atomic bomb on earth as being you know powerful imagine you know a million times the mass of the earth all being one atomic bomb i mean it's just yeah. an incredible explosion so um it, it a safe distance is really far um <laughs> you'd want to be a, a <laughs> many light years away because even if you don't i mean even if you don't I feel the force of that explosion from the particles and everything, but you do get these really high energy photons, which can just do wreak havoc to human life. And you know, that that's not good. Cosmic rays and, and gamma rays and things, not, not good. It's not a pretty picture. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is there anything in the vicinity right now within let's say 10 to 15 light years? Um, I think there are a couple of candidates for like a type 1A supernova, which is a different scenario than I explained. Yep. That might be about 10 or so. So, and then of course there's Betelgeuse, which some people know very well in the constellation Orion. That's farther, much farther. I think it's, uh, memory serves maybe 600 light years, something like this, 700. So it's far, but it could explode. And if it does, it will be quite bright in the sky, but I, we're safe enough distance from that one. 
yeah yeah the, so there's, there's a potential for a great light show and over an extended amount of time as well yeah they 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 take it depends on the type of supernova they take like a few days to maybe a couple of weeks to brighten because they're just so big they you know it takes all that to just explode and get bigger and brighter and then it, it'll take us several weeks to several months to fade and if it's close i mean you'll see it for for quite some time and it'll be invisible in the daytime which is pretty yeah, I saw that there was in one of your papers, you explained what the kind of, you know, depending on the actual energy and how luminous, if it is very luminous, it's actually slow. It takes us a smaller amount of time. I mean, a longer time, sorry, to reach its peak brightness and then to die out. Whereas there's some other configurations. I think they're A3 type supernovas, which are closer to the beginning of history. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so, so you're right on the, the superluminous take longer. They can take maybe 50 or 100 days to rise and then even years to fade. And, and the reason they're called superluminous is that they're, they're anywhere from maybe 10 to 100 times more luminous than just a, an average run-of-the-mill supernova. Yep. And they're, they're, they're extremely bright, but they hadn't been discovered until about 15 years ago. And you might think, how did you miss the brightest things in the universe? <laughs> but, yeah. but the reason that was hard to find is because, first of all, they're very rare. But secondly, it's just how people look for supernovae. Like people would, uh, you know, it takes a lot of telescope time. Telescope time is expensive, and supernovae are they don't happen that often. So people would target big galaxies because there's lots of stars in those galaxies, and they would just monitor those, waiting for one statistically to, to explode because you don't know when it's going to explode. So they would just monitor different galaxies every night, looking for this to happen. But these were big galaxies because you want as many stars as you can, and that's kind of was the conventional way of doing that. But we found out that these superluminous supernovae actually mostly occur in really tiny dwarf galaxies, and those weren't being monitored. And so it wasn't until you get these really wide detect wide field detectors that you're just looking at giant chunks of the sky that you actually see these things. So that was interesting that that took you know modern technology to get bigger and better detectors to actually find these bright things. I mean, bigger and better, and also from multiple angles, let's say, yeah. in terms of wavelengths and things. But, the, uh, but these population three stars you just mentioned, yeah, those are, those are um, there's three types. One's a pair and stability supernova, which might be what you're kind of alluding to. So the first just supernova described was when the core of the star collapses and it explodes. This is that fusion process going through different elements. That's a core collapse supernova, creative name, right? But the core collapses and it explodes. Yep. Uh, another one is one of type 1A, sorry, it's called type 1A supernova, and you have a white dwarf, which is the remnants of a star like our sun. Star. Uh, and it's in a one, either there's two of these, and they end up uh, orbiting and they lose uh, energy, and those orbits decay and they end up merging together. That could cause one. They merge together and explode. Yep. Or there could be a nearby companion star that's dumping material on it because it's really close, and that star has grown into a giant, and material can fall onto it. So as long as that white dwarf gains, you know, a certain amount of mass, then it can explode into a type 1a supernova. That's, that's the second path. But the third path is called pair instability, and that's really, really massive stars. So these things are maybe 150 times the size of our sun. They're so massive. There's really high temperature and the right conditions, not even in the core, but even outside into its envelope where you can co create pair production. And that's when you create a positron and electron at the same time. Yep. And if you do that, they'll, they'll come together and annihilate. And you've gone from making mass to then just making light. And then back and forth, they just go back and forth. That's like kind of E equals MC squared in action, <laughs> kind of energy yep. and mass mass to energy. Yep. But the whole point is the star is held up and the, a star is as big as it is because it ha it's generating light from its center. And that light creates radiation pressure that holds pushes out and makes the star big. And that's why the sun is as big as it is, because if gravity had its say, it would just collapse down into nothing. Mm -hmm. but that energy from its fusion in its core keeps it pushing out and keeps it big. So it sits there really big. So these stars have all of this light holding up all this material. But once you get this certain condition where they're so massive that you're taking all of that radiation, that light, and making positron and electron pairs, so mass, mm -hmm. you've taken your radiation and you change it to mass, you're no longer supporting the star. You do that quickly, it happens quickly such that the whole star collapses and there's nothing holding it up anymore. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing explodes into this very massive or very energetic explosion and just leave, leave nothing behind. It's just a complete explosion. And that's a pair instability supernova. So you made pair pairs, electrons, yep. positrons, and it becomes unstable. And so that uh, is the third type, but those are very rare and there are questionable detections. People think they've found them 
it's just really hard to kind of prove that or, or, or know for sure. But they believe that those happened very early uh, in the right shortly after the Big Bang because you have conditions where to make a really big star, you need very low metals, which we can talk about later, but you just need the star to be mostly hydrogen and helium only for this to work best. Okay. Yep. And so people believe that those occurred mostly in the early universe. Hmm. So yeah, so that, that actually does, because they only have fundamental molecules, it's, it's probably more consistent to think that they actually come from the earlier universe. And plus, I guess, you know, they're so massive, perhaps, you know, like this is something where I would see more of a, if we look at the, the, the early universe, this is how I sort of interpret it, which is kind of just a soup of plasma that is so dense in a certain location, then that expands, you know, at speeds, which actually do violate uh, the speed of light. But then there are certain conditions that allow that to occur. And perhaps some of these objects um, i mean are they you said they're quite rare but is their location quite definite quite clear you know in the sky if they're in certain constellations or the remnants are in certain patches of the sky well the superluminous supernovae seem to occur mostly in dwarf galaxies so if you look somewhere where there's not a lot of clustering of galaxies or maybe you know where areas where a lot of galaxy formation has not occurred like it's still sort of reminiscent of the early universe because the universe is kind of clumpy and patchy and it's a kind of a cosmic web, yeah. but there are areas that are more void and more uh, sparse of material. Yeah. And if they start out early like that in the universe, they kind of can remain that way for a long time, even until now almost, if, if you don't get a lot of contamination from all the other supernovae and things that pollute into the universe. Okay. And so that would keep those areas pretty metal free or element free other than hydrogen helium. And those, and they can form, and small galaxies tend to dominate those areas, so you can find them there. Mm -hmm. So that's this, that's kind of one area you would look. And also, uh, again, back if you look very far, very distant, you're looking back in time. So if you look very distant, you'll see these objects. You'll see some of the first generation of stars dying because you, you're looking back, say, 12 billion years. Mm -hmm. And if the universe is 13.8 billion years old, you know it takes some 0.8 or something to just have it cool down and form stars, right? And then the stars will live and die after a few million years, and then you start seeing their deaths. And so if you can have a strong enough telescope or a large enough telescope and see them, then you can actually see these deaths happen now that occurred back shortly after the Big Bang. Yep. So you can actually witness these things. And fortunately, they're very bright. So that's a good thing. So they're very bright and they can be seen. And we've seen things, we've seen these superluminous supernovae that far back, which is pretty incredible. Yeah, so they give out a lot of properties that, that help us really kind of investigate further, um, you know, um, I guess from the source and then kind of bringing it back in time towards closer to our own region, I guess, um, you know, the closest being what, four light years away. And we can sort of kind of infer a few things from source back to the closer objects. But one of the, the supernova types, which is the second category, the binary star mergers, those seem to exhibit very interesting kind of post-mortem or post-merger energetic uh, property, uh, which are super fast gamma ray bursts, and so neutrino stars. Okay, so now I see where you're... <laughs> yeah, so, so the type 1a supernovae are white dwarfs, Yeah, which, you know, ha that happens, but, but to kind of go on a parallel line there, so when you have these really massive stars, and if we go back to the core collapse supernova yeah. scenario, when that thing, when the core does collapse and the supernova does explode, you know, it's exploding outward with great prep, great force, but it's also pushing inward with great force. And that whatever's in that center core gets collapsed really, really compact, yep. really small. And that can, if the star is say eight to 25 times as massive as our sun, then that would collapse down to a neutron star yep. that you're talking about. So you have this little super compact neutron star, it's maybe you know, one or two times the mass of our sun, but it's the size of like, you know, Melbourne. It's, it's super tiny, super compact. But if it's bigger than that, say 25 solar masses or more when the, the star explodes, yep. then the core gets pushed so hard that it actually collapses down to a black hole. To a black hole, yeah. Yeah, so you end up with a black hole in those. But if you have these neutron stars or black holes, you know, then they're gonna just be out there in space because they've been created. 
Mm-hmm. And if you have, say, two of these massive stars that were orbiting in the first place, for example, mm-hmm. and say over time they eventually both died and they both formed neutron stars, we'll say. Yep. And you've got two neutron stars that are sort of orbiting each other. Okay. Yep. But over time, that orbit can decay and they get closer and closer because each of those warps space and time so strongly because mm-hmm. you uh, that they you can imagine if you have an object, uh, I don't want to get into that, but if you have an object in space, uh, gravity is basically warping space and time. And so if you imagine this object's placed there and it's warping space and time, but now you're moving this object, you're kind of creating these waves in space time, which is these gravitational waves. And so if you have these two objects orbiting each other, they're creating these gravitational waves and they're releasing energy that way. And so the orbits get closer and closer, they decay and they end up merging. And you get two neutron stars mergers, which is really exciting because not only did they create gravitational waves, which we've now been able to detect, but there was two of these that merged in a galaxy about 130 million light years away in 2017 mm-hmm. that the gravitational waves detectors detected. And we, our team and others around the world, detected the explosion of those two merging. That's called a kilonova. That's a whole different name. And that was quite an exciting event. That sounds like a rap group, Kilanova. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Right. So the really, you know, when I brought up the fact that everything is really kind of a transition from different states to states, molecules, you know, uh, to greater quantities of molecules that interact, then, you know, gravity um, or mass kind of creates this uh, collapse of the stars. The star itself then has a remnant, which is so dense, like you said, the size of Melbourne, but the mass of the sun, or maybe twice, three times the mass of the sun. But then this object, again, through time, you know, in this universe can encounter yet another neutrino, neutrino, neutrino remnant, and then they start orbiting each other. I mean, this is really kind of, it's pure, it's the butterfly effect, but at a universal scale. Yeah, so it seems really an incredible thing. And that, I think it was the LIGO and Virgo, um, uh, I think it's interferom- no, interferometers, interferometers, yeah. I think. Yeah. which captured this and both of them were supported by the integral telescope so uh, that it, 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 yeah it was also the so when this these two mer- these two neutron stars merged for that particular event i just yeah. discussed yeah there was a fermi which is the t- the instrument yeah. picked up a short gamma ray burst and you were talking about how these things produce gamma ray bursts yeah. Yes, and so that was a, 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 a it was predicted that this would happen but no one ever knew if it would or not Mm. And to see, to find out that these gravitational wave detectors detected something merging that had the signature of two neutron stars merging, which is already fantastic. Mm. Then the prediction says, oh, you should see a, a, a gamma ray burst that's really short. And we did. And then it says, oh, all of our models that have been worked on computers, no one's ever seen any of this, right? They just use physics. They say, okay, all of our models say it's going to show up in every wavelength and it's going to have these properties and it's going to look like this. And sure enough, it did. It hit it on the mark all the way across the board. It was really amazing. That is, yeah, that is amazing. And it actually comes from, you know, uh, E equals MC squared. It does. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Now, that, that is beautiful because it kind of comes in parallel with, with also the fact that, you know, the, the existence of uh, black holes has been proven and that's been recent. Yep. So, you know, it, it seems black holes and, you know, neutrino stars and the remnants of neutrino stars uh, and you know gravitational waves all of this really kind of is this persistent consistent physical model that we can almost use in our kind of imagination uh, mm-hmm. because this is real and therefore I believe it's very important for these discoveries to continue and you know the research to continue in this direction because as individuals in general we can either spend our time kind of being you know consuming different things which are there to entertain us but there's also another kind of entertainment and that is the one to really try to take the curtain of the universe and just you know open it ever so slightly but be able to still understand better how things are happening because we can do that at a microscopic level macroscopic level and also at a local level which is ourselves and kind of you know internalize it this is you know this is one of the uh, beautiful things about the research direction you're taking because all of this observation requires 
a chain of confirmations and validations, you know, of like this model is going to uh, create this effect. Well, if this effect occurs, then mathematically it means that this, you know, two or other uh, effects which are going to happen. Exactly. And the instrumentation with each wavelength allows us to actually confirm at each, you know, step of the way. But one of the things, if we have a gamma ray flash, Mm -hmm. let's say on the planet, what is the effect of that? If there's a gamma ray burst nearby or somewhat yeah. nearby, it actually will, if it's strong enough, it could actually, I guess the word would be sterilize everything. I mean, it would it would be devastating to, Earth, to, to life on Earth mm -hmm. on that side of the planet because it's so fast, you know, it doesn't get both sides because the Earth takes some time to turn. Yeah. So like half of the planet would be affected, which is terrible. Yeah. And it could uh, have, and if it was farther away, it'd be less of an effect. Cause I mean, the atmosphere prevents a little bit and protects us a little bit, mm -hmm. but, um, but you would have things, you could see things like mutations and things cause it would get all the way down to the DNA because it's just gamma ray high energy photons that just kind of pass into your body. And you can imagine, uh, it can cause cancers and things like that. Right. I mean, so it's not okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. Wow. What about gravitational waves? Those pass through harmless. All it is is just space and time stretching. So it stretches, but it's so microscopic that you would never ever notice. And it was unbelievable that they actually developed and built a detector to detect that. Because mm. I mean, this detector is four kilometers long or about two and a half miles long. Yep. And it, it stretches when a wave comes through and compresses, but that stretching and compression is less than the nucleus of an atom. I mean, it's so tiny, but they are able to measure that. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, and it requires so much energy just to create a little yeah, bit of that, right. that wave. Yeah, because uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, gravity in some sense is also some of the weaker forces in the uh, in the physical model. Uh, if I remember right, the, the classic physics model, uh, of which there are many flavors, and I'm not going to enumerate them now. But um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, to kind of move on a bit more towards the, um, I guess how we can try to identify a phenomenon as fast as possible. So as soon as it occurs, we need to be able to quickly switch our resources towards that direction in order to be able to capture that event. Because, I mean, when we look at the sky, there's so many points and dots everywhere that it's just, just it's, it's sheer impossibility to cover all of it with a gigantic photo lens because there are you know weather conditions and all of that but we're slowly getting there but there is a there's something you're you're currently working on which is extremely interesting and which would be very very useful to onboard people outside of astronomy and astrophysics and who could help with the process of discovery and that's the deeper wider faster uh, program could you give us a, a little synopsis of that of the program uh, sure. I mean, I think you, you put it well, like when you when you look at the night sky, most people look with their eyes, whatever, and they say, oh, it looks the same every night. What's the big deal? Right? It's mm -hmm. pretty static. But if you take a, a really big telescope, you can look at somewhere the size of the moon and it's you can pick up such faint objects that there are like a million galaxies in that tiny little spot mm -hmm. that actually, you know, if you're looking out deep and each one of those is billions of stars. So, you know, hundreds of billions. So there's, there's a lot there and, and that whole universe on that very faint level is very active, dynamic, things exploding left and right all the time. It's crazy. So it's not a calm, static. Um, and these explosions last all different, all time scales. It could be millions of years long, years long, months long, days long, seconds long, mill, milliseconds even. So it's the full range of time scales. And of that range, one of them, which is millisecond long, a fast radio burst. Yep. And this is kind of patient for this deep, wider, faster program because back in 2014, well, 20, they detected a, a fast radio burst in some archival data and then they started looking into them. And the fast radio burst is just you turn a radio telescope to the sky and you get this millisecond burst and that's it. And you think, oh, that's interesting. And, you know, maybe it's man-made maybe it's some satellite or military thing and you try to rule out those things and then and then they start detecting more and more and then they started getting the capability of being able to detect them in real time in 2014 which means when it happens you know maybe a second or two later that it's happened 
Mm. And they can alert people to say, hey, if you can turn another telescope to this area, do you see anything? And in the past, this has been very successful because these gamma ray bursts that you explained is a perfect example. I don't want to get into long history, but back in the 60s, you know, they built gamma ray satellites to look for people, countries uh, illegally exploding nuclear bombs because they released gamma rays yeah. and they were pointing down at the earth, but they also got a bit of the sky and they would see these gamma ray explosions in the sky and like, what are these things, right? They get these little bursts in gamma ray very fast, like a few seconds. And so they were a mystery for a long time. And when you get, once they just developed uh, equipment and the ability to detect them and alert people right away, you try and turn another telescope to that part of the sky. And they actually saw an afterglow, like there was an optical and other wavelength uh, shine that lasted a little longer. It could be seconds or minutes or even little hours. And they can take that and figure out what they are. So once they did that, you were able to get a spectrum of the data to get analyze it in detail. And they realized these things were at cosmological distances. These fast gamma ray bursts were, you know, billions of light years away. And they're like, wow, that has to be an incredible explosion to see that light all this way. And same thing with fast radio bursts. They, those things happen and they thought, well, these are crazy. Are they extra galactic? Are they from the universe or around here? And um, there were so many of them and they were from all areas of the sky. They argued that they were extra galactic. And there's also this very strong signature, which is very powerful. The light comes to us at a shorter wavelength first and a longer wavelength later. There's this like delay. Mm. And so, a very short wavelength, like say optical, maybe say gamma ray first and then X-ray, UV optical. Yep. As you go down the wavelengths into longer and longer wavelengths, that light would reach Earth first and then the radio later. And even in the radio, the shorter wavelength radio first before the latter. And when you had this signature, which is very telltale of photons going through the universe into ionized plasma, which I can explain more later, it all argued that they were from outside the universe, but no one can could find out what they are because this thing happened in a millisecond is gone. What do you do, right? And so we said, okay, here's what you do. You take every, I mean, this is not ambitious at all, okay? You take every telescope essentially that we have on earth in every wavelength that you can, that is the most powerful one with a big wide field of view and you just point at the same place of the sky at the same time. And some of those are radio telescopes and if they see it FRB, which is what the fast radio burst, Yep. Do you see it in any other wavelength? And can we get any information on that? So that was the first start of deep water faster. And that's over time as well. So, you know, it could be several hours, up to six months, uh, and, and even more just depending on the capacity of the supercomputers to, you know, to store that information and analyze it. But I guess any supercomputer right now couldn't really kind of, you know, uh, compute a fraction of the sky fast enough, you know, for us to be able to conclude quickly, I guess, in in order to be able to conclude quickly, there should be a larger number of people really observing the sky in a certain way. And, you know, to perhaps just listen to what is happening. I guess if a gamma ray, because I guess no, because if you're saying that the gamma ray, let's say the higher energies come first and then there's a delay and then it goes to lower and lower energies, then that means so long as we're able to pick up some parts of the higher energies, then at that point we can just, you know, look into it, put all the telescopes on that on that part of the sky, and then just keep analyzing the information as it comes through dynamically almost. Well, the, the good thing is that with technology and computing, I mean, uh, some of these wavelengths like radio and gamma ray, they, those telescopes have figured out how to analyze it very fast. Like they can, it's, they take a smaller, I mean, a decent size section of the sky, but not the whole sky. Mm -hmm. And they're analyzing it in, milliseconds to seconds or analyzing it, as, analyzing it really fast. So that's successful, yep. but you just have to wait around for one to happen. And yeah. some of the other telescopes like optical, if you have a wide field, that technology wasn't so good because it's a lot more objects, a lot more data, and that was hard to do. But now we've kind of gotten to the point where we can do it within like seconds to maybe a minute. So we're mm -hmm. kind of on that pace where yep. all these telescopes are getting data at, the, at essentially the same time and analyzing it and getting like movies of this guy at the same time. Yep. Now, the, the one key point though is if you're, there's many parts of the DWF, but the, which is deep, wider, faster program. But what the one part we're talking about is the simultaneous observation. And just to note that if a radio, if, if one of the goals is to get a fast radio burst, if the radio telescope detects a fast radio burst, 
it already happened at the other wavelengths. It's, it's been, it was previous to that time. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so if we're all on the same field at the same time, just doing really fast cadence imaging, and the radio telescope says, hey, we found one, now you look back in time and you say, hey, you were on this, you know, 30 seconds ago, did you see anything? That kind of thing. So that's the, for that component of the program, that's that's how we go about it to, to try to find out what these are. Okay, yes, because we do have, uh, you know, sections of the sky, and if we know that occurred, then there's, yeah, there's a time at which we can just trace it back to its original burst, I guess, that higher energies. But all of this, all of this kind of surveying in the sky is done with terrestrial telescopes and orbital telescopes. So the terrestrial ones are kind of limited in exposure time because of the, uh, I mean, first, the location is very important. It's got to be clear skies. And I'm guessing there's also uh, a certain amount of um, angle at which point the information is just is just going to be obfuscated either by atmosphere or other phenomenon which is which are closer to our planet. So, in order to just really be able to observe uh, the entire sky, I mean we can't do that right now, can we? With all of the telescopes that we have. No, we can't. I mean, the telescopes, especially the fact that we need the biggest telescopes. The bigger the telescope is, typically the smaller part of the sky you're looking at. Yeah. And so you're, you know, you can like, you do these pinpoint really deep kind of things. So we're using really big telescopes because these objects are very faint and very fast. Yeah. So using those big ones, there's only a couple on this whole planet that have the equipment we need that are big enough that have a wide field imager, et cetera. And so there's one in Chile and there's one in Hawaii when it comes to optical. When it comes to radio, the ones that do FRBs, are there's many there's several in Australia that's been leading that work. There's uh, one in South Africa now. There's uh, a, a one in Canada and one in uh, Netherlands. That these these are around the world, right? And so far in Netherlands, I yeah. think South Africa is SKA and the Mersh. Oh, what is it called? It's the name of a cat <laughs> in South Africa. <laughs> well, there's so yes, there's there's meerkat in uh, meerkat. South Africa. Yeah. Yep. And there's, uh, there is LOFAR, but the one I'm thinking of is uh, West of Orbis, an instrument oh, for that. Yep. But that's fine. Then there's CHIME in Canada, which yep. is a, a nice uh, telescope. And then there's uh, a, a several in uh, Australia, including Parks, Malangalo, ASCAP, and, and Murchison Whitefield Array might be what you're thinking, but it, it's, it can do it. It's just at a very low, low wavelength. Low so anyway, there's a lot of radio telescopes, but the, the first problem, as you noticed very astutely, is you know we're trying to connect these telescopes to look at the same place in the sky and the earth is round right i'm sorry but it is okay and so and when you have a telescope in chile for example our, our optical imager and you have a radio telescope in australia that's far apart and to get them on the same field at the same time you don't have many choices you know the earth's turning and so you can you, you only get little areas of the sky that's common to them and then all of the other wavelengths have to be done from space so we have to have space-based telescopes and they have their own constraints they have to point away from the sun they can't point into the galaxy that you know the earth gets in the way half the time there are all these things that that we have to worry about so so we try to coordinate all these telescopes to do that and that part of the program has been successful but only happens about once or twice a year because it's it's a tough thing to do mm -hmm. there was one potential and this uh, potential kind of way of you know, getting a bit more of a putting a bit more pieces in, in the puzzle because it just it just feels as though the interaction between each let's say instrument let's call them all instruments whether it's going to be a satellite or uh, a telescope or any other kind of sensor array or single object is that they all have a pattern across a puzzle so if we took the earth and we flattened it out each of these objects is able to have exposure time uh, within a 24-hour span. So if we have access to all of the different data streams and we know their location, we know their, uh, which quadrant they are in, what kind of motion they're taking, and so on, so, and also the level and resolution of the instrumentation, the filter used frequencies, then we could sort of form this kind of pattern uh, which becomes almost periodical for every object and then we can sort of convolute that into one specific image and also including the timestamp 
to get kind of a multi-angle view of a single object that can sort of be interpolated as well between missing values. Yes, I mean, like uh, on one hand, uh, if things last long enough, like you're saying, and you know, you're using up telescopes around the world or in space to image it or taking data, you can form that. But I mean, with a radio telescope, an array is kind of what you're describing with interferometry, where if you're on it for a small amount of time or you have an array, you can yep. use that that yeah that to that information to localize it. And actually, that's what's been done recently, mm -hmm. is that even though these objects last a millisecond or so, they've been able to uh, use GPU computing and, and have the software localize these things. So they actually localize them to, you know, the sub arc second position on the sky, which is for some of these. And that's been a game changer because now instead of saying, you know, this object's out here somewhere, you know, search all of these, that 10,000, you know, 100,000 galaxies for something. Now you have one galaxy. Now that's yep. easy. And so that's been done and they've localized it and gotten the distances of those galaxies. And those distances have uh, matched this thing I was telling you before, like if the light comes through the universe, the the shorter wavelength should last should land sooner before the longer wavelength. Longer wavelength. And and the amount of that delay depends on how much ionized material it traveled through. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a farther away galaxy, then it would travel through more and that delay is bigger. And if it's closer galaxy is less. And you can kind of guess the distance of the FRB from that delay and the redshifts of the distances they've been getting to these galaxies have matched which is quite extraordinary mm -hmm. and so these are actually indeed extragalactic objects they happen in other galaxies which means they're incredibly powerful i mean for something to flash a millisecond be seen halfway across the universe that's a powerful burst of energy mm -hmm. and so that's been game changing and so so as we've been describing, one, one hand is this burst. Can you catch this burst? Can you catch the burst in any other wavelength that can tell you something about what they are? But the second thing is, like a gamma ray burst, those burst, but then they have these afterglows. And it's kind of the pro physical processing of that in its location. Like if it's a supernova, you might have a burst, but then that interacts with the ejected material and that takes some time to heat up and cool. And you've got this afterglow. And so if FRBs have afterglows, that could be something that lasts seconds, minutes, hours or something. And so the second component of DWF is to keep these telescopes on the field and to get others to move towards any burst to see if it has an afterglow hmm. and try to figure out what they are. Are there any gamma ray bursts which kind of come out of nowhere, out of complete darkness? Um, well, I mean, that's kind of how they happen. They just happen randomly somewhere. And then eventually, I mean, like they have telescopes now like Swift, which if it detects a gamma ray burst, it moves within some seconds to point at it. Well, it has a very wide field of view to find gamma ray bursts. And it says, you know, somewhere in this big patch of sky is a gamma ray burst. Mm. And it can kind of localize it to some arc minutes. And then it slews the satellite over because it also has on board X-ray, UV and optical telescopes. Yep. So once it slews it over, then those get some data and look for this afterglow. And then when they do that, they say, oh, where did it come from? And then you can maybe find a small, a uh, very distant galaxy at that location, or sometimes maybe nothing. But hmm. when you see nothing, it's usually because you just haven't gone deep enough. If you get really, see really faint things, it can be like a very faint galaxy or something. Nothing that's coming. Okay. All right. So yeah, it's never really something that just kind of flashes out of, you know, imagine there's a point we're observing and then all of a sudden there's just this flash and not there wasn't a star or anything before that like there's nothing like that occurring out there in the sky it would mostly have really kind of a historical you know um historical continuum let's say uh instead of just appearing out of nowhere because i started imagining things like a gamma ray burst that just occurs let's say around a black hole like you know around an equation disk and it just you know like a star gets close enough to it that it just gets completely destroyed and the burst occurs but then the point at which you you're looking at it uh is initially just completely dark yes yeah, so, so that could be the case i mean it's usually it, it it's going to take something like a cataclysmic event like a star explodes or dies or collapses yeah. to a black hole or some you know huge event but it's going to have some source it's either some massive star or it's, like you said it's by a black hole or it's yep. material falling into black hole. There's always like something causing that, not just kind of out of uh, thin air or space, I should say. 
Yeah. Mm. Okay. So let's say with supermassive black holes, which are usually what active galactic nuclei, we have one in our own galaxy, uh, in our yep. Milky Way. We could potentially just keep looking at that portion of the sky because there might be some some stars that really just kind of get you know eaten and and, and and put to shreds by by the black hole itself. That's that's right. Now it's you know unpredictable when, and it's usually. Over a very long period of time, you have to monitor for like a million years. Who wants to wait around a million years for that to happen? But yeah, how can we do that? I mean, <laughs> I mean, digitally, I think you know, for instance, the HST, like you know, maybe we have about 10, 15 years, yeah, uh, of observation at a certain frequency. Yeah, we'll see how long that can last. It'll probably end up in Australia one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, in order for us to be able to kind of involve that time ahead uh, in looking from the future is really kind of one of the consistent, how should we, how should we say, magic, like skills that we are required to have when we're doing astronomy and astrophysics. To this effect, it is, all of those are actually mathematical concepts. The predictions are based on mathematical concepts, so it's a thought process, it's a thought experiment. Uh, usually starting with, you know, very kind of childish questions. And then we, uh, you know, take each of the, the hypotheses off. Okay, we, you know, we pro rapidly mentally prototype a model. And then we, you know, the, the, the advantage of this, as opposed to trying to prototype something in hardware, is that we can just kind of filter out the non-valid options and then quickly go converge into something that is potentially true. And it seems through all of this work, there's, and this is one thing that I kind of really see a, a great potential is the sonification of all these phenomena. Yeah. So for instance, we didn't really cover uh, alignment alpha, uh, but I guess, am I correct to say that it's kind of a break in the composition of the spectrography of, uh, oh. of an object, usually a galaxy? Yeah, so here, I think, we, yeah, what you're describing is, um, yeah, when you have galaxies, they have a spectrum. So, you know, it emits over all wavelengths, and that's kind of just the rainbow in, in optical. Yeah. But it's a different amount of different wavelengths, and there are a lot of atomic transitions that make either a strong emission line or absorption line. So you get these features. Yeah. And that's the spectrum. Now, uh, for a very distant galaxy, um, that light comes off the galaxy from the stars. But as we mentioned earlier, you know, the universe stretches during that time by the time the light gets to us. And so if we're gonna look with an optical telescope, which covers, you know, say blue to red that we can see with eyes and the human bit wavelengths, I should say, yep. um, then that those wavelengths are, uh, have a certain size, but they, have, they must have started out much smaller from the galaxy and then stretch to that wavelength now because we're going to be looking at some certain wavelength. So a smaller wavelength from optical is ultraviolet. And so this, when we look at very distant galaxies, the ones that we look at, we're looking at their ultraviolet light, but we're seeing it as optical light. Mm -hmm. And that ultraviolet light has different transitions in particular hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe and hydrogen is these, these uh, atomic transitions I was talking about, there's one called Lyman alpha. It's one, it's one of the major transitions in, line, in, in hydrogen. It's when the electron goes from like the ground state to the first like, L orbit or whatever the energy level. Yep. And so this is a very common element. It's a very strong uh, transition. And so we see that. So Lyman alpha is a very strong indicator of these galaxies. You can use that as a signature to identify them. But the Lyman break that you're talking about is a little bit short word of that yet. So it's even a bluer UV where uh, the best way to describe it is that the, the photons of light with that much energy. So as you go to shorter wavelengths, they have more energy. Yep. So Lyman alpha has a lot of energy because it's at a short wavelength. But if you go shorter yet, then you get even more energy. And those photons of light are so energetic that when you encounter an atom, they just strip off that electron. Just so much energy strips it off. And so it's 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 absorbed that way, and and therefore you don't see any light really anymore from that galaxy. So the galaxy light almost stops at that point. Hmm. It gets depressed. It gets suppressed a quite a bit. I mean, there's still some, and that's hopefully we're, we're trying to find how much. But this is like a break in the spectrum. So it's going along, and all of a sudden you see this just drop off of, of light. 
But so hopefully that made sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does because in some ways, you know, photons they voyage in a three D space, Euclidean space, I guess, and in some ways that also gives a bit more information about depth because most of the times when we look at an object in the sky, it's just a two D canvas. However, yeah. you know, with all of these 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 um, these parameters and these properties that we can use with the wavelength, then we can not only define characteristics, uh, movement, or the, the spectral kind of ghosting of movements, what direction the spin of a galaxy or another object is taking by checking out its redshift. Uh, you know, there's so many of these, these, these parameters that we can use. And I guess to kind of put it back, patch it back to what sonification would be, which is uh, one of your projects as well, uh, which is amazing. It's to be able to actually interpret all of these, these, these parameters and properties in a way that we can, you know, listen to things. and. Um, I guess just to kind of define the space and the, the, the potential capacity for, for sonification is that it's that capacity to for our the sills in our eardrums because we've got millions of them. Like in our eye, mm -hmm. we have about 1.8 million pixels that we can, you know, at one point, if we focus, it'll be much smaller in size and in resolution. But in total, with our both eyes, we can have, you know, twice 1.8 million pixels. Uh, and when we go around the perimeter, they get blurrier and our, our visual cortex is able to focus on smaller areas and give us more resolution, you know, edging, lines, etc. However, when we use sound, I'll give an example is I spoke to you about the John Coltrane thing where we take multiple notes, accelerate them to 150,000, it becomes a complete blur, but then go up to 200,000 and the notes which were being composed kind of recompose themselves from this blur and that's just that's just to give you the the idea of how much how capable our eardrums are and how advanced they are as well um and this could be Absolutely. used really at a much better advantage when it comes to astronomy and it's in a combination also with just human brain evolution with sound because yeah you were talking about the line alpha and line break for galaxies. So that's one area of work I do and there's some sonification that we can talk about for that. And then there's a second stream, which is this deep water faster program. Yeah. There's sonification for that. And both have very different applications, mm -hmm. but they're very powerful, the sonification, which we can, we can talk about some more here. Yeah, uh, so the, we can start maybe with the Lyman Alpha because that's a concept that you know some some of our, our audience may not be really you know may not be able to, to touch or conceptualize really uh, because of the condition I myself have actually seen before, so I can imagine and visualize you know what the specter let's say of light yeah. is. So in terms of the Lyman Alpha, if we tried to sonify that, how would that occur? Yeah. So there 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 are a couple of ways. Some are some are pretty simple. Um, so a spectrum, uh, to explain it, is that um, if you can imagine a 2D plot where the x-axis is wavelength, and in this case we'll say short wavelength on the left and longer, going longer and longer to the right, so that's kind of a wavelength of light. And it doesn't have to be lined off, it could be any wavelength, it could be visual, infrared, anyway, just wavelength. Yep. And then your y-axis would be uh, the intensity of light, like how bright is it. And so faint would be you know, at the bottom and bright would be at the top. So as you plot each data point for each wavelength, some object's going to emit light, and it's just going to be a different amount per wavelength. And in this case, at a high redshift galaxy, you would have some light, so we'll say just some level of light, we'll call it one, okay, just kind of going along, bouncing around around one. And then when you get to the wavelength of line alpha, it might have emission, and it would shoot up to like 100 or something. Hmm. And then it come back down after a few wavelengths, because there's a little bit of width to that. Yep. And then it'd be going back to wherever level it was and that level is basically a combination of just millions of stars all these stars are producing light over all these wavelengths and it's just this big integrated amount of that and then it gets more complicated because there's gas in between us and the stars and that absorbs some light and then there's these absorption lines and etc cetera, etc cetera. but the spectrum basically is this kind of uh you can imagine a a, a line a, you know, a line going across the plot that just has a whole bunch of spikes and dips and up and down and moving around. And each one of those tells you very important information. It tells you, because they're at specific wavelengths, so it'll tell you this is, you know, the transition of carbon. This is a transition of oxygen. This is uh, hydrogen. This is, you know, magnesium or something. It tells you how much is there, the temperature. It tells you if it's moving toward you or away from you. It has all kinds of information, which is amazing because it's, you know, 12 billion, you know, 
light years away or something, right? Yep. But you still get that information and it's fantastic. So that's a plot, but if you want to sonify it, one way to do it is to make that brightness a higher pitch. And if it's faint, it's a lower pitch. Mm -hmm. And then you move across the wavelength. And then if you, as you move across the wavelength, you, just, you can go left to right or right to left or go back and forth, however you want to do it, mm -hmm. and whatever speed you want. So we have this tool that was developed by Jeff Hannum at RMIT, it's called Star Sound, that can do these things. And so one is it takes in a spectrum and it just says, okay, let's just play it left to right. You can go fast or slow and it signs some, you know, it could be a musical instrument, it could be a tone, you can do whatever you want for the sound and it moves it around and you can hear that. And so if you're listening to it, you know, all of a sudden you hear this big spike, you say, oh, that's the Lyman Alpha. And then you might want to find out, you know, where that is in wavelength space, et cetera. So you can, you know, you can probe it for different information, but that's a, that's a 2D plot that's done that way or 1D, I should say. But there's also, as you were saying, if you have, if you can imagine an image of a galaxy and maybe it, uh, and it has, it's sort of a little bit pixelated, so it can pick a pixelated image of a galaxy. So it could be some spiral galaxy or even just a round fuzzball of a galaxy. But if you had a pixelated image in 2D image now, each one, there are instruments now that take each one of these pixels and produces a spectrum per pixel. Mm -hmm. So it's saying your galaxy now might have 100, 200 or so squares on it, but those squares, each one of those has spectroscopic information. Yep. And what that means is some part of the galaxy might be coming toward you, some part might be going away from you, and you can tell from the spectrum which parts are. And so the other tool which uh, we have is called Box Magellan, actually does that. It takes these spectra, they're called uh, integral field unit spectra, spectra so IFU, mm -hmm. and it will take that and it'll scale it to your trackpad on your computer size. And so that you can feel the edges of your trackpad and that's gonna be the size of the image. And as you move around, you feel where the galaxy is and then each pixel, you can figure out the spectrum. So that means that we can actually have this really kind of, you know, stereoscopic, almost 3D effect because, I mean, technically it wouldn't be 3D because with our current technology, everything is kind of limited to the horizontal stereo span. We could slightly do forward and backward uh, panning, but the main difficulty is the vertical panning part of things. So, but there are some techniques that could, uh, that could be used to kind of solve that problem, but to be able to dynamically listen to the morphology of a galaxy over time is really something absolutely mind-blowing. Yeah, so so Jeff Hannum, who's been amazing on this, he's a sound engineer, and so he's brought a lot of sound engineer tools to this. Yep. He has a group that tried to do, you know, I, I posed them the, the challenge of, can you, make, can you take an image of a star or a galaxy, and then with a single tone, have that person tell what that is? And they created this, this kind of sound thing, a, a sense that it was like a, a bell. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of get a sense of the cavity of that bell and the shape of that bell. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you hit the objects, it would give a certain sound. And that's, this tool is called Sophia. And also it told you kind of where it was on the image, which was pretty interesting. So, so there's some early exploration in that. But with, this, with the 1D spectra, you're exactly right. It's in, we present it in stereo, so you can hear it left to right. So yep. if, it's, if it's wide, presented wide, you can kind of think in your mind, okay, I'm gonna visualize a giant plot in front of me, and you can go left to right, and then the pitch is exactly that, is trying to be up and down. Now, with the IFU spectroscopy, you know, you can feel on your trackpad where you are, and you can feel, and it can give you information by sound that's coming towards you or away from you, but the step we're trying to take it now is to use kind of a virtual reality 3D headset and directional sound to give you a more three-dimensional feel of that, and that exploration, I hope, will get a better better sense of the sounds coming toward you, away from you, and then more of a 3D feel of what's there as opposed to this 2D spectrum. Yeah, I'm actually really looking forward to demonstrate a couple of the experiments <laughs> that I've done. Um, in, yeah, in regards to that, because there's a, um, I guess I'll, I'll just kind of do a bit of a quick accolade about, you know, the FITS file format. It's a standard format for astronomers and astrophysicists. Uh, I mean, it could go into other areas as well, but this format gives us a lot of information, not only about the image, but also what it's called uh, the HDU, the, the header, and the primary header is where all of the kind of calibration, filter, what type of mission, who is the author, you know, it's either if it's public or private, all of that inf information is just packed up in, at the top of the file and the rest is actually the photo 
imagery and there's also a way to kind of use this over time so if you look at it in a certain way it becomes a 3d matrix and so to be able to kind of voyage through traverse that 3d matrix and by mapping uh, each individual property into its own kind of source and using the stereoscopic capability but kind of limiting how we can orbit around the object because we can only advance you know move forward or backwards in time so that would kind of be the uh, depth uh, perception of the, uh, the sonification system. And if we wanted to get a bit more information across, let's say, the transiting lines, then we can potentially use a rotation gesture. And therefore, we could sort of separate, you know, we can use stereo separation horizontally but at every angle of a given object. Uh, and I guess some of your early works was with uh, exoplanet transits. Yep. And so the idea would be that most of the, the transits, we would love you know, for it to occur horizontally as we look at it from our, from our vantage point. But the universe being the way it is, transits can occur in any angle, except that I don't believe there are different planets that have, you know, they all orbit you know, on the same plane most of the times. Uh, otherwise, it would be some exotic objects we haven't found yet. Uh, well, the thing is, because the the stars are, you know, on that scale, so small, you know, it has to be lined up. So, yeah, if you have all these different orientations of, of planetary systems in space, only the ones that are kind of edge on toward you are yeah. the ones that are going to exhibit this eclipsing or transit. Yeah. Because, yeah, if you're off a little bit, then that's going to just miss the star either above or below. You don't see anything. That's right. But with the current resolution of telescopes and maybe kind of you know using this convolution method of taking multiple telescopes looking at at the same object although the image is still very blurry uh, as he explained some of the stars actually uh, a fraction of a pixel large so those would be very very difficult to to be able to map out over the stereo however there's some still some objects which can fill in about 25 pixels or so well, I think I see what you're getting at. So, yeah. so I think the thing is that a star, any even the nearest star, is so far away that you know it's in reality mm-hmm. much less than than any pixel in any telescope. It just gets either blurred by the atmosphere into multiple pixels or not. Yeah. And so it's it's not a spatial thing unless you have some you know a really big star with adaptive optics or something. You're not really going to ever see a size of a star. All you're measuring is does the amount of light that reaches you reaches Earth decrease a little bit yep. or increase a little bit because it was that shadow or that little planet moving in front you know, took a little bit of light away from it and so you're just looking for that little dip in the brightness or a little or not that's all you're looking for a little period to see that dip yep okay yep. so that means that i used an initial myth to, to kind of just separate each of the modes of the you know of the frequency of mm-hmm. the object coming through so i thought it would there was a possibility of you know kind of changing aperture over specific points that we will look uh, that we will look into um, and then combine all of these to kind of perform kind of an overlapping you know overlapping listening I guess of what's happening but it's just so small uh, you just pointed out that uh, it's really kind of a blur so we have to remain within the the flux of energy that's coming from that point in the sky yeah, but I'm glad you brought up uh, this whole time or temporal aspect because, you know, on this second track of stuff we were talking about with deep water faster, you know, yeah. that's looking for transients which just explode or fade away or they like burst and go away. And so, you know, the whole aim of that program is trying to find the fastest burst in the universe. And we're trying to find them, but some of them last, you know, minutes or hours. And so if something's like, say, a few hours long, now there's this, you know, way of monitoring that and listening for that with sonification. So if you if you're collecting data say once every minute and this thing lasts hundred minutes, you've got a hundred data points to listen through and go up and down. Right? Yep. And and if and if you're listening for that and you hear that rise, you say this is something rising, then you know that's and you confirm it in a number of other ways. Then you can trigger another telescope somewhere on Earth to swing over there and try to get some data on it before that thing fades down in those few minutes. So you just do it fast. So there's this big urgency along. You hear something coming, rising really fast, as fast as you can. You know, analyze it and and trigger a telescope. And those telescopes are big. You don't want to trigger something on 
an artifact and you know, you'll know you never be in this business again, right? And so you wanna make sure, not only do you wanna do it fast, you wanna do it extremely accurately. So what does that mean? You gotta use everything you can. You know, every kind of technology there is, sonification is fantastic because not only does it help do the same thing that you can do with your eyes, but it adds other things. It, not, it adds verification, first of all, but it can do, it takes advantage of this human brain capability of listening. There's there's harmonics, which yep. we've talked about before. So there's, I can mention that in a second about taking advantage of the different harmonics. There's the cocktail party effect where you try to pick out a sound and noise, and that's what we're trying to do a lot of the times. Yep. And and there are these other aspects using uh, dimension, three-dimensional sound and directional sound. And, and so there's a lot we can do with sound that's gonna enhance this. And, and I mean, I'm happy to explain this more if you're ready. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so if, if a, so one of the things that I think is quite untapped is that most of a science and astronomy has been very visual. You got plots, you got images, but you know, you say, oh, well, here's one property, here's another property, we'll plot them against each other, is there a relationship? And then you say, oh, here's another property. We got three, okay, do we do a three-dimensional plot? That's kind of hard to show someone, but okay, right, on a piece of paper. Then you got four or five or six. Okay, now this gets to be a problem, right? You can use symbols and whatever. So if you want to analyze something that has lots of properties and everything can be related or interacted, interacting, you want some way of doing that. And sound is, I think, is an untapped resource for that. Because if you were to hear a tone, same, tone, so same frequency, same volume, same duration, but one was from a flute and one was from a trumpet. Mm. You would know instantly one's a flute and one's a trumpet. Yeah. Same tone, same, everything's the same. How do you know they're different? How does that mind know that those are two different things and recognize what they are? Mm-hmm. And that's because that instrument's designed such that it plays that note, which might be 440 hertz. But because of the design of that instrument, you get these overtones. You get integer multiple wavelengths. You get some. You get 880 hertz. You yep. get 660 hertz. I mean, you get all these other hertz coming off that, or integer. Sorry, 880 and then 12, what, 1320, whatever. I can't do math. <laughs> but you know, you get these. You yep. get these additional wavelengths coming out of that, but at different strengths. Yep. You, you know, if it's a if it's a flute, maybe the second and fourth harmonic are strong, and the rest are weak. And if it's a trumpet, maybe the sixth and ninth are strong or something. And so. Right there, you can see that you have like maybe 10 or 15 different harmonics to work with. And the strengths of those makes this quality of sound or this timbre. So if you have 10 or so 15 properties and you just scale them, the strengths of those properties are gonna give you a timbre to your tone. Yep. And so I think that's a, I mean, it's gonna take a lot of training to understand what those tones mean and et cetera, but there's a big potential there, I think, for that to, so that to be uh, incredibly helpful in this, in this process. Mm. I guess there's also, yeah, it's because it's the, uh, usually kind of, you know, the harmonics are multiples of each other and, you know, uh, they, uh, they double and then, you know, there's also quite a few modes in which we can actually harmonize or deharmonize. Uh, so all of these really have, give us an enormous amount of qualities, I guess, of the, the hue and tone of a sound. And mm-hmm. if we can add the stereo aspect of it so that we could sort of localize what, you know, what is happening and we can arrange each of these comparative sound effects, you know, within that stereoscope, it's, um, and especially more of a surround system scope that gives us 360 degrees, at least, uh, at minimum, within which we can actually place different properties within a certain kind of physical space and then play them together. I've done a couple of experiments of just putting uh, multiple different graph lines. Yeah. Yeah, just graph lines, sonify them, but then kind of spread them across the stereo. And it's very interesting. It does require a bit of practice to understand what exactly is going on. It needs a bit of explanation of why, you know, what's happening. And I think maybe starting from uh, the simplest elements of what, how you can identify certain objects. So, 
let's say, you know, in what we do in computer science and machine learning and astronomy and everything, there's the concept of a, of a normal distribution. That's something that most of us learn in high school. Uh, but then afterwards, we get a bit deeper into that, into that concept. But what a Gaussian distribution is, is really just a bell shape. And so if we can, you know, take a bell shape on the right hand side and then see another graph line and put it on the left hand side, and say, well, is the left-hand side kind of following through with the right-hand side? Or if we have multiple kind of objects that we can take multiple stars in a cluster, and then we take maybe just one, uh, one property, but then we align them over the stereo pan, we can say, oh, well, this star is definitely not a hypergiant. It's more of a, you know, it's got a lower rumble kind of thing sputtering along. So that one was probably category, you know, K. And is it possible for that to occur within a cluster of stars, which are like that at that distance? So all of these questions can really kind of surface once we sonify these things, because we pay attention. I mean, myself being blind, I, I will only pay attention to that sound. I'll be putting laser focus on yeah. that sound in yeah. order to pick up anything that I could figure out. And when we know that, uh, let's say if you take a brightness of, uh, you know, 100% uh, versus 99.9997%, visually that's indis indistinguishable. However, with sound, just a fraction of a decimal, like a very, you know, small decimal of a change uh, in the tone is immediately perceptible. And that's from everybody, unless, you know, you have some, uh, some hearing impairment. But generally speaking, with most human beings, we'll be able to perceive that. Well, I think on top of that, I think if you assign a frequency to say uh, to 100% and you assign different frequencies for every tiny bit lower, yep. as soon as you hear two frequencies that are not equal, that dissonance you hear immediately, as opposed to if they're the same where you hear a nice tone, right? Yeah. Like, yep. yeah, as soon as that goes off a little bit, your brain goes, oh, that's a horrible sit down, right? Because there's something going wrong there and it's just a tiny bit off. That's right. Yeah. And that allows us to really kind of take those points and perceive, you know, perceptions. And I guess it's the human interfacing for people in general to be able to use a certain method to listen to that, perceive it, and add the cultural effect of what what is the objective? What are we, you know, we're looking at the sky because it's really kind of reflecting us on us all of the possibilities of what the universe, what the universe kind of really functions, uh, how it functions, and if we can kind of put this this kind of it's almost an activity it's edutainment it's uh <laughs> yeah. and it, yeah and it's also helpful for i think people in the sciences uh who may be looking at creating the scape for discovery so that the rest of the people can start discovering and then getting the confirmation let's say from the authority like the scientific authorities which are people who are experts and you know who are deep into each of these fields and you know there's a system that could be used for us like myself and you know my friends and we can just kind of put something on and say well hey look this you know in that area there seems to be like an interesting region where there's some cosmic background noise that we've uh, aggregated over a certain radial region and it sounds kind of different from that other space well let's see how about we pour in the sounds of the stars which are within there okay how about we filter that to just the uvs and gamma rays uh, you know over a certain timeline what kind of effect do we mm -hmm. get and I think there's just an infinite amount of possibilities right there. Just so many different possibilities. And, and another is what I was saying earlier about this um, uh, cocktail party effect where you're trying to yes. pick out signals out of noise. I mean, everything in astronomy, I mean, things are far, ridiculously far, and they're faint. And so you're always pushing limits on like, you know, improving your detectors. What's the faintest thing you can see? What's the, you know, you try to, you're always pushing the edge. And so, you're against the noise all the time. You have this little faint signal you're trying to pick out. Mm -hmm. And so FRBs, which we talked about earlier, I mean, I can play an example here now of some sonification of FRBs, which yep. I find online, but it's uh, from a Casey Law who did it. So it's an FRB that uh, repeats, actually. There's a few of these, I think just a couple. And they, it's not usually an FRB, it's just a single burst, but a, a, a couple of them they've seen repeated bursts. Yep. And so this is observations of that, but the thing is, the signal sometimes is okay. You know, you, you, you're looking at data plots or images. You say, "Oh, that's fine." And then there are some you're like, uh, "I don't know. That's really pushing the limit." But you can hear it, even though you don't necessarily see it, which is amazing. Yeah. And so I'm going to play this, and what you're going to hear is 
this FRB sounds like a chirp because it's uh, the plot that's plotted is going to have frequency on the x on the y-axis, which uh, goes from uh, high frequency to low. So that and then on the x-axis is time oh, in yeah. like milliseconds. So so because as I mentioned before, the the shorter wavelengths, sorry, yeah, shorter wavelengths arrive first. Yep. it'll start at a high pitch and then it'll go down to low pitch. So it kind of goes choo, like a choo, because it's you can hear it go high to low. Yep. Okay. Yep. So that's how an FRB would sound if you saw, or one way it could sound if you sonify it. Mm -hmm. And so I'll play it. And I think there's maybe about six or seven, eight, seven or eight of these different sounds and see yep. how many you can, you can make out. Okay. Okay. It's, I think I'll share the screen just because it might sound better. So I'll do that right now. You ready for this? Yep. Okay, there's a, just an opening dialogue saying this is nine bursts from the fast radio burst, FRB 12. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, it's um, it's it's like this 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 kind of electronic laser shot, you know, that just That's passes right. by. Um, <laughs> exactly. Wow, it it kind of sounds like you know the the the, the birthplace of uh, of uh, you know sound effects for for sci-fi, and it's <laughs> I hear that I hear that everywhere actually. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, yeah. of course, you set that to whatever sounds, but the thing was. The high pitch, I think, was harder to hear just for our ears, and the lower pitch was clearer on some of these. So sometimes uh, in the images when it was a really low signal to noise, but if it heard more at the lower pitch, then I, you could hear it better. Yep. So you could always tailor that and switch the sounds or something, you know, to make it pick up the signal. But the thing is, it does, there was at least one in there where when you when looked at by eye, you'd say, oh, that's just noise. It's like snow on the screen. Mm. But you could hear a tiny bit of a sound that's in there. It's pretty amazing. When you can hear it, yeah, that's because it is inundated in noise. And that noise, generally speaking, does that come from, it comes from several things, right? It, it can come from regional interference. It can come from cosmic background noise. It can, yeah. you know, just a whole bunch of things like that, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is radio, so some of it is, I mean, some of it is, you know, terrestrial or whatever. I mean, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, energy that's coming from yeah, a multitude of sources that's been you know some traveling across the universe and not but it's it's just such tiny bits of it that it just is kind of this puts on background noise you know, just mm. as a thing. It's, it's such a shame that we're going to have so many telescopes and uh, satellites you know in yeah. low earth orbit that th this yeah. could cause some disruption especially for the radio astronomy radio radio it's bad but i mean they operate in certain bands so they're kind of allowed to only you know operating these certain bands. So radio has kind of some hard out bands that they can work on, even though, you know, the bands that you transmit are getting more and more packed with data. But it will affect the optical a lot because we take these deep images and with satellites streaking across, you've just kind of ruined your image, you know, or they'll go across something you want to see or, or worse, if we're trying to find these really fast uh, transients, like a little, you know, just one second burst, you know, sometimes these satellites are, are rotating and they can just like glint you know, they have like a reflection of the sun or something. Like, well, was that a satellite or was that actually something we're looking for? You know, yeah. this is bad, right? So, you know. But I guess you can go through that that second responder chain, you know, where you have a glimpse of it and then you see if, you know, there's still kind of this diffusion, I guess, over the lower frequencies. I mean, what, what was interesting here is that the sound went like, so you start from the higher frequency and then it goes down to the lower frequency. But as you said, there's also kind of a delay happening as you go into the lower frequencies. Yes. Um, that was, you know, that wasn't as apparent. Is that because you've only taken like a certain band of frequencies, like just a gamma yeah. and a UV? Okay. Yeah, that's just a little strip. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So that means the more instruments we can just point at it and sonify, the more we can actually really kind of, I guess, listen into the, the morphology. Well, the thing is, it, we don't know how far uh, radio bursts extend in wavelength. 
because yeah. we've tried to find it in other ways and we haven't seen them yet because you know things like deeper water faster hadn't existed and so hopefully we see them but if, if they do exist yes you're right there's gonna be many seconds of this where it'll last it'll have a long duration where we can hear it if we've got a lot of bands covering it okay do you have like a number let's say of total sfbrs which have been found so far or within a certain amount of time is it is it a very very small number or is there enough for it to kind of have you know give us kind of a time lapse but then to give us kind of a surround sound overview of where they occurred in you mean total number of fast reader bursts found? yeah yeah oh yeah i mean it, it was only a handful until recently and then these telescopes have been finding crazy so there's, i would say there's probably a few thousand now that are known. Oh, wow. Yeah, so there's a lot of them that are just coming in daily. It's just that they aren't localized well, so we're not sure, you know, you don't have that information, but you have their signature mm -hmm. and you'll have a, a sense, like most of the telescopes that find them in large numbers, say they're, you know, in this rough area of the sky, they can't localize them well. So yeah. that's a little bit harder to, if you wanted some kind of, you know, over the sky overview. But the telescopes that find them with better resolution and localization, they find fewer because it's just they're looking at a smaller area of the sky and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, and if you, so with optical telescopes, some of the widest fields there are on big telescopes yeah. is about, say, three square degrees on the sky, which is, you could fit like, I don't know, what is that? You know, you can put uh, several full moons across, you know, that little, basically it's surprisingly, I mean, surprisingly at arm's length, you can block the full moon with your pinky. I mean, that's how small it is on the sky. Even though it seems big, it's yeah. really tiny. And so this is maybe, you know, a, a, a thumb's width or something, right? So, I mean, you got this little area of the sky, which is still gigantic for optical, but the chances of finding a fast rate of burst in there over a course of like two weeks is maybe, maybe one. It's really rare. They're happening all over the sky, but you don't know where and when. So the chances of finding in that little spot is hard. And that's what's been the difficulty with deep wider faster is we run this thing now seven times over some half nights so some maybe 30 hours in the shot and we haven't found any at the same time so we're waiting for one to happen to then figure this out so it still could happen anytime but it hasn't happened yet and also kind of we can there's still petabytes of archived data that we can still sift through am i correct yes, too? absolutely okay yes. and that would really kind of chain into the you know the citizen science component absolutely. of a uh, deeper wider faster yeah, if you were to go through those radio data like this, you would probably find a lot of things. Yeah. Hmm. And perhaps even certain messages, but I mean, that that's for the most, you know, those with more imagination can you that's know, right. go a bit deeper and yeah. <laughs> wider into it. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, there's also, so the main, is there some place that AstroSound and Vox Magellan can be used for uh, some of our audience? Is there a date within which you know that could be potentially uh, reaching the public? Um, it's it's still in uh, how do I say it like you know prototype stages. I mean we're using it with our team. Yep. But the aim is to try to get StarSound working with the. There's this other tool we have. It's called Perceive. You probably won't remember if that's okay. But there's this web tool that we let people go through the DWF data. That's right, yes, awesome. yep. So you can sort through that. And it, we're trying to sonify that. So if we get successful with that, we're just short people right now, but if we get successful with that in say some months time, then I'll let you know and you can pass that out to everyone. Then they can get online and look through our data. And the Box Magellan might be later, but I don't know, we'll see. But we'll talk to Jeff Hannum, he'll, he'll have the information. Uh, yes, I do remember the Perceive, uh, and I did ask if there was an API, but currently it's still internal. Uh, but if, yeah. um, I guess some of the tests, I could actually literally go to the website and try to extract the information and, you know, uh, try to create some automatic sonified versions of it, uh, see if it's... Um, yeah, I mean, because these, these tools that are doing sonification, the, the aim is to do, you know, do science, do good research with them. And once we get them bulletproof and they're working well, then we say, okay, let's just let the public now do science and do research. So it's, yep. less, of, it's less of a game or gaming thing. It's more just, this is actually, you're doing science. You know, you're taking these, you're listening to these things and you're actually discovering transients or you're discovering spectrum things. That's, that's the aim. Yeah, and it's actual, you know, it's actual hardcore science, uh, but yes. designed in such a way that it's actually universally accessible. That's a really, really beautiful concept, actually. Mm, I'm very you. excited to, to hear more about it. Um, you know, 
And yep. uh, well, I'd like to thank you, Jeff, uh, sure, for, thank you. for this interview. It was amazing. I mean, we, you know, we kind of went around uh, different uh, themes. I hope I haven't confused the audience uh, with my questions. Right. Uh, but you actually, you know, took on the torch really well. And I think uh, this is going to be a great, uh, great episode. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it.